uh, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and what's known as the European Consortium. This is a collection of, again, about uh, 14 or 15 countries in Europe that contributed various components. JPL contributed the detectors and the, in, the cooling capacity. We have a little refrigerator, a cryo cooler that keeps the mid-infrared detector at 6.7 Kelvin. The near-infrared spectrograph is a multi-object spectrograph uh, given to us by the European Space Agency. It has components from the US as well, though. The detectors came from the US as well as a micro shutter device. This is a uh, device that allows us to selectively open uh, shutters and let light through to pass them to a uh, the spectrograph. Uh, there are some, uh, about a quarter of a million little shutters that are operated uh, electromechanically. And uh, this is the first time anything like that has flown in space. The fine guidance sensor and near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph is the Canadian contribution. Uh, they will be providing the guiding to keep us uh, on track. So I like to say our neighbors to the north are keeping us pointed and focused for this mission. And then the main or the workhorse instrument of Webb is the near infrared camera. Well, you'll hear me say near cam perhaps. That was provided by the University of Arizona working with Lockheed Martin. And it's this instrument that's going to produce the amazing pictures that Webb will generate just like those that have come from Hubble. Uh, our main industrial uh, or main industry partner is Northrop Grumman. Uh, they worked with Ball Aerospace to develop the telescope, the uh, optical, uh, the OTE, optical telescope element. And then Northrop Grumman has built the spacecraft element, the sun shield and the spacecraft bus that houses all the infrastructure we need to uh, operate in space and uh, remain healthy. Over the past year, we've had a couple of major uh, integration and test milestones. And it was late last summer in August of last year that the two halves, that optical telescope element, which has the instruments there behind it, came together with the sun shield. And so this is a little video. Uh, I'm hoping this plays well uh, about that. And there is some sound with this. So I'll click and let this run. So Eric, the Google platform doesn't transmit the sound, but the video is coming through nicely. Okay, well, yeah, the only sound is just little background music. No one's actually talking, so. So imagine in your mind some majestic music playing here. <laughs> Flight of the Valkyries or something, yeah. So, so Webb is, is all together. It's sitting uh, out of the plant at Northrop Grumman. Uh, just, it's about three miles south of the LAX airport at their space park facility. And uh, over this uh, year since it was put together, it's been going through various tests. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. Uh, the telescope itself is a three mirror anastigmat. So a convex primary, a con uh, uh, cave, uh, secondary, and then uh, a third mirror that corrects for astigmatism, flattens the field, and also provides for a wider uh, field of view. Uh, so our field of view is roughly like that of Hubble, though. Uh, so you can think of Webb. Um, astronomers will use it the same way they use Hubble. Uh, other instruments or uh, history tells us where to focus the telescope and we will point it there. It's not a discovery telescope. It's not a survey telescope with an ultra wide field of view. Uh, rather, it's gonna have this uh, coffee stirrer uh, view of the universe uh, at any given time, but to a depth uh, exceeding any telescope on the ground or in space. 
Uh, if, if I could back up a little bit more about the history of Webb, uh, those studies where Hubble didn't see the earliest galaxies pointed us to building Webb, saying we needed an infrared telescope. Uh, and they told us we had to go to the infrared because uh, those earliest galaxies were not detected by Hubble for two reasons. Uh, one is Hubble ran out of aperture at uh, two and 2.4 meter uh, diameter mirror, it couldn't collect uh, light from the faintest objects, these earliest galaxies. So we knew we needed a bigger mirror. Uh, Webb's is uh, six and a half meters in diameter. And because of the expansion of the universe, the peak of the emission from these early galaxies was shifted from the visible into the near infrared. So that's how we knew we had it to to build this near-infrared optimized telescope bigger than Hubble. And we'll talk a little bit more later about why Webb looks the way it does, because uh, it doesn't look like any other telescope. And uh, that's actually part of the reason why I think the public's imagination has been so captured by it. Uh, I mean, it really looks like a spaceship from the future. And uh, for those of you who remember Star Trek, I'm always reminded a little bit of the Tholian Webb episode where those uh, spacecraft were flying back and forth. It reminds me a little bit of that. So over this past year, uh, I mentioned there's been a lot of testing since they've uh, put the two halves together. And one of the recent tests that they completed was deploying uh, under one gravity, that sun shield. And you can see a little bit here at the start of this animation, they have to lay out tables to pull the sun shields out on because they're designed to work in zero gravity. And the sun shield material itself is Kapton. So that think of uh, like a plastic, uh, a lunch sandwich bag type material but it's the size of a tennis court. So it really can't support itself under one G. And so they have these tables there to help support it before they tension it up with cables that run through it. And you'll see a little bit of that in this next animation that shows the sun shield deploying. Uh, and again, imagine whatever favorite uh, majestic music you have in your head playing in the background. Eric, while this is playing, um, we had a question from Linda Thomas Fowler about the slitless spectrograph. About she was curious how how a slitless spectrograph works. Sure, a slitless spectrograph is actually you can think of it as the oldest type of spectrograph. It's basically just a prism that's going to generate a spectrum of everything in the field of view. So. Uh, light from the field of view is passed through a, a dispersive element and you get a spectrum of every single thing uh, that the telescope uh, can see at that time. Now, as you might imagine, because Webb can see uh, very deeply into the universe, you're gonna have crowded fields. And so that makes this sometimes a slitless uh, spectrograph can result in a very confused fe uh, field where you have spectra spread out for every single thing uh, all across your image plane. So you rely on software to help you tease out the particular objects you're looking at. And uh, uh, there are also some uh, types of studies that you really wouldn't want to use a slitless spectrograph for because the fields would be too crowded. Say, if you tried to look at a globular cluster, that just wouldn't work. Uh, but other fields where the uh, other areas of study where the fields aren't so crowded, that works just fine. And you now get not only the spectra of the objects you're interested in, say, if you're within the galaxy, maybe an open cluster. If you're looking at a cluster of galaxies, the things in the cluster, but of course you get a spectrum of everything else in the field as well. And all of Webb's data will be archived and available publicly, just like it is for Hubble. And so while you may have said, oh, I'm gonna do a slitless uh, uh, spectrograph observation of this cluster of galaxies, there may be some other astronomer who's interested in uh, high galactic latitude stellar populations. And then they would be able to go in and pull out every single star that was uh, 
that got a spectrum in that field that you were looking at the galaxies in. So uh, a slitless spectrograph has the potential to generate a lot of ancillary data that's useful later on. Uh, that's one of the advantages uh, of having that. Whereas the micro shutter device, uh, you're going to use that for very deep, long exposures for the faintest objects. So you want to block out all the things you're not interested in and just let the light from a few select things in. Uh, an uh, another interesting thing I know people will do with the, the multi-object spectrograph is shape uh, their slits, if you will. So instead of just having to have a straight slit, in, like in a normal spectrograph, you could now shape your slit to be uh, correspond to whatever object you're looking at. So that's an interesting application uh, for that instrument. Wonderful. So, so thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Let's talk. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about where we are. Um, with the hardware, uh, I promise we'll get to some astronomy later on, but we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit about the telescope first. Uh, along the left-hand side of this chart, there are four uh, big chunks of activities: uh, observatory pre-environmental deployments, observatory environmental tests. So right now we're in that top box of activities. We're doing things. Each of those are broken up into the little boxes that follow, and you can see there are green check marks, meaning we've done those things. Uh, we're leading up to this next big chunk, which is called the observatory environmental test. And this is where you subject the whole observatory to the environment it will feel in the launch vehicle. So you blast it with the sound it would hear during launch, and you shake it. Uh, like the you like the rocket itself will on the ride up, and so they're doing some tests to get ready for that. They'll do this environmental test, and then they'll do that deployment all over again, just like we saw there with the sun shield, uh, to verify that after a simulated launch, everything works as planned. Uh, and once that has happened, they'll fold it all back up again. And it is that point that we are ready to go for our launch. So let's talk just for a second about the launch. Where are we launching from? Well, this is another contribution from the European Space Agency. We will be launching on uh, ESA's Ariane 5 rocket out of uh, French Guyana. The Ariane 5 is right now the world's most reliable launch vehicle for its class, for you know the amount of mass that it can lift. Uh, been over 100 successful launches uh, of the Ariane 5. And so we're grateful that this is one of the contributions in addition to those science instruments that uh, ESA has given to us. So when they're all done with the testing out there in Southern California, we will get on a, a large ship and uh, take a trip down along the west coast of the U.S. and Mexico through the Panama Canal to uh, French Guiana. Uh, and uh, this is un maybe an unusual way for U.S. payloads to get where they're going, but actually Europe does this all the time. And it's, in fact, how the Ariane 5, the rocket parts, get from France uh, down to French Guiana. So they're very used to uh, handling things uh, on the ship, and it's a big giant uh, shipping container that will take this down there. So we, we're now getting ready to launch, and this is another difference between Webb and many other telescopes, and Hubble in particular, in that we are going to go one and a half million kilometers, about a million miles away from Earth. Hubble is, of course, about 250 to 300 miles above the Earth, and it was put there because it was it and the space shuttle developed uh, more or less at the same time, sort of uh, bootstrapping one another. Hubble was designed to be serviced, so it needed to be close so that astronauts to, could get to it. Because Webb is this infrared telescope, we need it to be far from sources of heat. The Earth is a giant source of infrared radiation or heat, so we want Webb to be very far from Earth. And so we'll go out to this Lagrange point. We'll be far away from the Earth. 
And it also allows us to keep the earth, the moon and the sun, the three brightest infrared sources in the sky, more or less to one side. And that's why we have a sun shield, a parasol, and a, essentially, rather than a tube for scattered light. Uh, and the next uh, slide shows a little animation. Uh, there we are, you can see the five Lagrange points. These are uh, points of uh, gravitational stability discovered uh, in the late 1700s by a uh, Franco-Italian uh, mathematician uh, Lagrange. And if I run this animation, you can see that we will actually be at L2 orbiting the sun, but following the earth around. And so here you can see the little animation runs. There's the moon going around. You can see the L2 point traveling. And here is Webb orbiting about the L2 point and using the sun shield always facing the sun, the earth, uh, and the moon, so to keep those sources uh, on one side. Therefore, we don't need a tube to baffle us the way most telescopes do. Webb will be run at the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is just sits on the campus at the Johns Hopkins uh, University, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Uh, here you can see a picture of the building from the outside and the nice control center they've built inside. Uh, they will do the complete commissioning of the observatory here. And after we launch, so there's fire and smoke, great excitement, and then people will say, you know, where, where are the pictures? Where's my data? It will take us six months to commission Webb. Part of the reason is we, we're going far away, almost like a little planetary mission. Uh, we also have to cool down, and you want to cool down in a specific sequence. You don't just let the telescope cool uh, as it would want to, because as it cools, you want to control where water uh, outgasses from the system. You don't want it to go on your optics. And so there's a very controlled method using heaters of how you let elements cool down. And this, there will be another slide coming up that talks about this long process of commissioning before we're ready to take data. Now, they've been practicing at the Space Telescope Science Institute for the past year. Uh, right now, those rehearsals are suspended, although they're still doing software development because you can do a lot of that remotely. So, so this little graphic here shows all the things that have to happen as we commission or get web ready to observe. Uh, starting there on the left, uh, LVSEP is, uh, that's the separation from the launch vehicle and upper stage that happens 30 minutes after launch. And then shortly after that, our solar array uh, comes out. And that's so we're power positive. Uh, that's the first big uh, success moment we're going to be looking for after launch. Then there's uh, a mid-course correction burn. And you can see that it isn't until uh, about uh, sort of 10 days or so out there that we begin to deploy. And the deployment is complete about three weeks after launch. And so this is the mirrors unfolding, that sun shield coming out. And uh, that sequence, that whole deployment sequence starts once we've already passed the moon. But even once we're all deployed, there are still months of activities that have to happen that all those mirrors uh, are held down to a, black, a back plane structure for launch so that they're stable and then they're released. And then each one of those segments we can move uh, independently and change the shape of. And so as they're cooling, we'll be moving them around and uh, trying to discern which uh, the focus of the telescope and uh, 120 days or so after launch, that's when the telescope will be aligned. And so then you're primarily just will have been using the near cam, the near infrared camera to do that. And then from then on, you now start to commission your science instruments, all the various filters and modes that you would want to use on those instruments. You're checking those out 
and making sure they're ready. So about six months after launch is when we expect to see the data. One of the challenges we'll have is, is bringing the public along during that period because you don't want to just go radio silent. Uh, you want to bring people along and say, this is what we're doing today. This is the, these are the kind of uh, signals we're getting back. And uh, hopefully the folks in communications are developing a good story that we can uh, relay to folks as we're uh, doing this commissioning up in Baltimore. So now getting to more, how, like how can you react or how can you interact with web and what will it be doing? So there's a link on this screen and there's a, a picture here on the right of the various software tools that exist for planning and uh, practicing how to use web. You can go to that uh, link there and uh, just uh, referring on the right, there's a thing, the APT is an astronomer's proposal tool that you could set up a program to do observations. The ETC is an exposure time calculator. You can put in your uh, favorite objects and see how long it would take web to uh, reach a certain signal to noise. And uh, I can tell you because it's so big, it gets the very high signal to noise incredibly fast. So a lot of the early use of web will be very short exposures because even a few seconds on web lets you see deeper into the universe than anything we've ever been able to do with Hubble or the Spitzer Space Telescope or ground-based telescopes. Hey, Eric, actually, can I in inject a question? Sure. Um, Getting to the uh, to the bit about planning, um, you had mentioned earlier that that Webb is not a discovery, not a survey telescope. It's a it's a an instrument that looks through a soda straw once you've already figured out what to look for. So uh, you there needs to be another another source of information for planning the missions. Um, so question is is there an is there another explorer telescope that are either in operation or in the plans that might pair with with the web to you know be the finder be that survey instrument that helps identify the the targets that's a that's a great question and our finder scopes webs finder scopes really have will be the hubble space telescope and the spitzer space telescope those telescopes have already discovered a wealth of interesting objects, and we will use Webb to explore different aspects of the physics of those. Uh, we, of course, have ground-based surveys from decades of work, and uh, so astronomers will use, uh, let's just uh, take an example of uh, star formation regions. We know where their local stars are being formed, and the most famous one everyone's probably familiar with are the Orion Nebula. So we already know a lot of places to look, and we now have this new tool to look at them with Webb. Uh, so we don't need a separate, uh, I'll say, finder scope mission. There's plenty to look at. Uh, already. And what I suspect will happen, because it happens with every one of these missions, someone will say, oh, you know, let's look at Orion with Webb because we know stars are forming there. They'll look at it. They'll see something like, oh, you know, we didn't expect that at all. We, now we got to look at some other known star forming regions to see is, is just Orion that's weird? You know, are the theories wrong? So uh, again, astronomers will bootstrap themselves there. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so speaking of, uh, you know, what are people going to be doing with this telescope? We already know some of the pro uh, some of the plans that folks have for it, uh, and there are two classes of uh, observations that are already planned. Uh, I'll go to this first one here, which we call our early release science program, and you can see there are thirteen proposals selected here. I'm not going to read uh, these studies to you, but they span the range from uh, observations within our own solar system to the deep universe. And what's unique about this program is that these data will become public immediately when they hit the, the archive. 
right now, most observations from Webb have what's called a small exclusive use period. So astronomers get to work on those who proposed and won the time, get a year to work on the data before they become public. Uh, with early release science, we're going to make the data public instantly. And these teams, these large teams that have gotten together to do these programs uh, are also being funded to develop some, uh, I'll say, community analysis tools so people can uh, get some early practice with web. So even if your first round of uh, writing a proposal wasn't successful, there's probably some data in this early release science similar to what you wanted to do. So you'll be able to get those data and you'll be able to use tools that folks have made for uh, analyzing those data. And that will help you write an even better proposal the second time around. So we already know that Web is going to be doing these things uh, once it's uh, launched and commissioned. Now, in addition to the early release science, there's a program for what was called guaranteed time observers. And uh, this is a small group of scientists that were selected back in 2001 that NASA used to help define the requirements for the mission, or in some cases, build the science instruments. And um, they proposed science investigations in this proposal long ago, back in 2001. And uh, they've been advising us uh, low these many years. And they, they come from uh, the US, Europe, and Canada. And you can see along the bottom, there's a link there that describes the programs that they will be looking at as well. And just like the early release science, they, uh, they have the full range. You have people who are planetary scientists who are going to be looking at the outer solar system. You have folks who are going to be doing deep universe science. So pretty much uh, from our own solar system to the first galaxies uh, are going to be investigated by these folks. Uh, that, that actually reminds me one thing I, sh I should point out. The architecture of Webb, because we don't have a tube, means that we can't observe anything interior to the Earth in the solar system. So Webb can look at Mars, do observations of Mars, its moons. We can look at uh, Kuiper Belt objects, any of the outer planets, comets, uh, asteroids. But we can never observe Venus or Mercury because we can't look back towards the sun because we don't have a baffle. And we can't let uh, the light of the sun uh, get on to the mirrors. So that's uh, one uh, a sacrifice we've had to make. But I have uh, always say working for NASA, if we want to learn about Venus and Mercury, we should just go there. Are there any other limitations that the, the geometry around the L2 point um, provides? Uh, in, in, in particular, can you are you able to look, um, you know, to the north and south pole directions? Um, you know, of the not not nest, not at the sun, but away from the sun. Are you able to look north and south, or are there other? Um, you know, does it, does orbiting L two imply that there are parts of the sky that are not imageable? So the the L two orbit itself doesn't uh, impose any restrictions. The only restrictions we have come from the fact that we have this sun shield and naked telescope architecture. Now, what that means in practice, we can tip the telescope, uh, you know, about five degrees backwards, so towards the optic, and uh, about another 25 degrees forward towards the sun shield, uh, and then uh, it's got a five degree roll, or, or, or is that a yaw? Now I, I'm forgetting my uh, terminology here. Uh, what this means then is as the L2 goes around the sun, the telescope can observe an annulus on the sky at any given time. But during the course of the year, that annulus sweeps the whole celestial sphere. So we can observe anything uh, in the sky except for inner planets. Uh, it just depends on different times of the year when they're visible. And we do have uh, 
both to the north and the south of the ecliptic so-called continuously viewable zones. So you can always see those targets uh, during the year. And it's at those places where you can imagine people doing the deepest exposures because you could just sit pound on something for days yeah. uh, uh, at, that, at that location. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, just looking at some of these uh, early observations, the early release science and the guaranteed time observer GTOs. Uh, that first year, those two groups will take about half of the observing time available to the telescope. And then general observers will get the other half. Uh, a call went out on January 23rd of this year soliciting proposals, what to do with that. And in all the subsequent years, the general observers will have uh, more than 80% of the time. So it was only this first year that we have the ERS program and the GTOs must use most of their time in the first two years and they have pretty much all elected to use most of it in the first year. Uh, but there you can see just the distribution of the kinds of things that people will be looking at. Uh, and no surprise, this first galaxy study, the reason that we wanted to build web in the first place is the uh, area of uh, concentration that people want to spend most of their time on. But the other surprising thing is exoplanets. In 1996, when we were first conceiving Webb, we knew of precisely two exoplanets. Uh, they were orbiting around a pulsar, so distant you could never observe them. So the initial designs for Webb didn't take exoplanet observations into account at all because we didn't know we had to. Uh, fortuitously, the near-infrared spectrograph will actually be very useful uh, in allowing astronomers to study the atmospheres of exoplanets. So even though we didn't design that from the beginning, that instrument has capabilities that have made it so interesting. And now that we have thousands of uh, exoplanets to look at, uh, you can see that people want to spend time on web doing so. So that, that's pretty exciting because we didn't even imagine it would be used for that, but it, it's the second most popular thing. Uh, so I, I put this picture in here just because we've had a lot of word slides. And so now we can just take a deep breath. Ha. Ah and look at the sky here. So this is just to ground ourselves. This is why we do this here. Yeah. Uh, so, so what are some of the, the famous targets that we know that Webb is already uh, gonna be looking at? Uh, up there, this, the so-called goods field north and south. These were the places where Hubble and a lot of other telescopes have spent a lot of time looking for early galaxies and Webb is gonna look at those. Uh, some famous uh, galaxies there in the next line from active galaxies, interacting galaxies, Seifert galaxies, and of course nearby uh, dwarf galaxies. Uh, in the stars, uh, supernova 1987A should be a very interesting uh, observation because you can now compare the decades of data that Hubble has with uh, what Webb will get. Uh, some of the exciting exoplanets, and we're learning almost daily of new ones. So uh, by the time Webb is actually flying, I'm sure there'll be some even more exciting ones there. And then pr again, pretty much everything in the outer solar system is gonna be looked at with Webb. Uh, so I mentioned that the call for proposals went out on January the 23rd of this year. The original proposal, proposal due date was May 1. Uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, situation, we we're going to delay that now, and we will wait and see how uh, it, this whole activity plays out and what that means for the launch date before we uh, request the community to send in their proposals. Of course, they're free to submit them anytime uh, that they want to now, but we just don't uh, have a due date. And uh, uh, astronomers have been waiting for this for a long time. So uh, I found this little clip on the web and I, this to me captured uh, the excitement that the community has felt as they get ready uh, for web observations and waiting for its launch here. <laughs> and there we go. So a little excitement. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, there are uh, a lot of places you can find information about web on the web. Uh, in, in particular, the nasa.gov slash web will take you from a, an overview page uh, that will then uh, let, lead you to the website at the Goddard Space Flight Center, which is the lead NASA center for developing web. And you can learn tons about the hardware and uh, the history of web there. At webtelescope.org, that will be the public's interface uh, website. Uh, right now, there's just some background science stories, but because we don't have any data, uh, that site uh, doesn't have a lot on it yet. And then finally, this uh, SVS, that stands for the Science Visualization Studio. Uh, this link will take you to a, a website that has not only science visualizations, movies and whatnot of the construction of web and science uh, uh, theoretical models for web, but anything that was done at Goddard. And if you want to spend uh, some enjoyable time poking around, seeing some high tech stuff, uh, I would encourage you to go there. Uh, we have social media for those of you who are, uh, you know, follow Instagram and Twitter, you can do that uh, there as well. Uh, so uh, I know that's, uh, I've gone through things pretty quickly there, but I would be delighted to take any questions you have about web, uh, you know, its history, what it's doing now, and what it hopes to do in the future. So again, thank you very much for having me here and uh, letting me talk about web. Oh, Eric, well, thank you so much. I mean, uh, there, there are folks are still putting up questions for us, and this is great. Um, so there's one. Um, a gentleman asks if Web is launching with some kind of a of a shield or a plate that's going uh, up in uh, conjunction with the um, with the camera to uh, to block part of the field of view or obscure part of the sun or part of a star's uh, disk in order to help identify uh, exoplanets and exomoons. Is that is that in web or are we thinking or is he perhaps thinking of a different different uh, telescope? So so he's referring to a coronagraph there, which yeah. is, uh, you know, imagine, uh, you know, using your thumb to blot out a a bright star or or the sun in the sky. We I believe have, it was Victor. I'm I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm I think I, I was uh, meaning Spitzer, not Webb. I'm. Oh, okay. Well, Webb has uh, a corona graph on it. It does have some spots that you could, uh, by moving the field of view, put a bright object behind the coronagraphic spot to blot it out. Uh, yeah. In the in the parlance of uh, you know exoplanet observations, this isn't very high contrast, so you could use this to detect and directly observe uh, large Jovian class planets around nearby stars. NASA's kind of next big mission uh, after the one that's currently in the pipeline following Webb will probably be designed with a really high tech coronagraph that's specifically for imaging exoplanets. So we'll get started there, but uh, our real strength in observing exoplanets will be using the spectrograph for what's called the span transit spectroscopy studies of Webb. And this is when uh, you take a spectrum of a star that is known to have a planet or orbiting about it. So you take a spectrum of the star, and then when the planet passes in front of the star, between the star and us, you take another spectrum and you look at what light the planet's atmosphere, if it has one, has subtracted out of the stellar spectrum. And then you can learn about the planet's atmosphere. And most of those observations in that little bar chart where you saw exoplanets were people doing these atmospheric studies of exoplanets. Uh, and so I like to, you know, putting on the poet's hat, I like to say that, you know, we'll use these uh, observations of Webb to breathe the atmospheres of alien worlds. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Um, I have another question here. Uh, as someone asking, are there plans to observe stars undergoing transformations like Eta Carinae or, or, Bet or Betelgeuse? Uh, 
I don't know of any of the, the current uh, guaranteed time observations or early release science that have planned to look at those, but that is what the general observer call will tease out. I can guarantee you those are both you know, excellent targets for web, and I'm sure people will write proposals, uh, especially Betelgeuse right now is you know, yeah. it's undergoing a lot of uh, throes of excitement. And uh, it, it actually, you know, it's incredibly bright. So that's going to be one of those things where uh, you know, a, a couple of seconds on web is probably you may saturate if you go longer than that. Wow. So for, um, for my own frame of reference, can you remind me the, the difference in size between Hubble and Webb, uh, be between the, uh, the primaries on those two? I sure. Mean, it's a huge difference, but I can't remember the numbers. Yeah. Um, in area, just primary mirror area, it's a factor of seven. Webb is seven times larger in area. It's a six and a half meter diameter for Webb and a 2.4 meter. Uh, now, you may think like, oh, seven, that's, you know, that's not, uh, that's not such a huge leap. But in addition to that gain, we have an area. Webb has kind of the next generation or so, probably a couple generations, more sensitive detectors. Mm -hmm. And because we are not going in and out of the Earth's shadow, the way Hubble okay. does, we can tend to observe things uh, more efficiently. So you'll uh, occasionally see in uh, c communications for the public that uh, if you factor these things in, Web is sort of a, like a hundred times more powerful okay. than Hubble. Okay. Um, another question, uh, perhaps getting, you know, I don't know if this is getting further into the weeds or getting more basic, but just a simple question from someone here. After the telescope has has observed a, a target, um, how does it how is it storing data and getting that back down to down to Earth for for analysis? So it does have some uh, s solid state drives on there. When an observation is made, it's stored on board, and then we have a couple of passes uh, a day, two eight hour passes in every twenty four hour period. Uh, over the deep space network. And so twice a day or minimum once a day, we will be sending data back down through the deep space network and uh, sending commands back up. Uh, another difference between uh, Hubble and Webb, uh, and this is just a, uh, a function of, you know, uh, Hubble is essentially flying 1970s technology and Webb is yep. sort of, late 90s, 2000s. Uh, Webb is an event-driven telescope. So when they communicate with it, they'll, you know, send it up a, a batch of things to do, you know, do, do this observation with the mid-infrared instrument, then move over to this target, take a spectrum here, then move to this target. Uh, if anything goes wrong in that sequence, Webb will just move on to the next thing. It's uh -huh. event-driven, whereas Hubble was told at this exact time you're going to do this at this exact time you're going to do this and if hubble had a fault yeah it just said well you know i'm not supposed to do the next thing for an hour so i'm taking a rest uh, yeah. uh so this event driven allows it also to be a little more efficient wow that's excellent so um how how long well is the bandwidth of the deep space network sufficient to downlink all of the data that the scope could hold, or would it take multiple passes if you filled the solid state memory? Uh, it, it can get it down uh, in, in one pass. And in fact, that was one of the design requirements that we be able to fully download. Uh, in, in fact, we can miss a pass, still be taking data, and then download it again. So we sized the memory on board so that we could get it down and not uh, overwrite it, in other words. Uh, in, uh, I'll say, in, the, in these days of big data, mm. web isn't a huge data mission. Uh, most of the time, we're staring, we're collecting photons, and uh, it's not like uh, 
I'll say an earth science mission where you're looking down at earth, or if you're looking a solar mission, looking at the sun where it's photon rich and you're just, you're streaming data as fast as you can dump it. Yeah. We're more collecting and then transmitting. Okay. Um, what, uh, what's your, the current best guess at the operational lifetime? Oh, great question. Um, so the formally the, prime mission of Webb is five years. That's pretty standard for NASA. You make a mission and it's got like a five-year prime mission. We are sized for 10 years of operation based upon the fuel that we take up. That turns out to be our life-limiting uh, element to the mission. Uh, and we take up fuel because uh, like most uh, space telescopes, we use uh, spinning reaction wheels like gyroscopes to move around. You change the rates of those wheels, uh, just like you've seen the experiment with a spinning bicycle wheel and you move the bicycle wheel around and the person in the chair goes the opposite direction. That's how we point the telescope. But eventually those wheels uh, get what's called saturated. They're spinning too fast in one direction and you have to push against something to slow them down. And what we push against is a little thrust from a, from a rocket. And so we've taken up enough fuel for 10 years of operation. Now, what I suspect uh, is that if we get a nice, uh, what's called a good clean injection to orbit from the Ariane vehicle, we won't have to use any of that fuel to nudge us into orbit. And that will probably add a year or two and I suspect as the Space Telescope Science Instrument learns how to work the observatory and schedule it efficiently from a momentum buildup point, we might even get a little more. So uh, I'm hoping for something like 12 or 13 years. Okay. And Actually, I'm uh, gonna, should I stop sharing my screen here and go to a yes, personal yes. view? Yeah, yeah, we'll be able to go face to face. So I, I assume that you know, unlike the Hubble, Webb is not outfitted uh, for expected um, visits for refueling if need be. I mean, being out at the out at the Lagrange point, you're you're not going to be sending up a, um, a a mission to refuel when you come close to your ten or twelve years. Is that a fair guess? So, so right now, yeah, we don't have any planned. Uh, refueling mission. But what we're doing uh, as we finish up the development of Web is we're making sure that the fuel ports where we'll actually fill it up are, uh, you know, well documented and accessible that should a future mission to figure out a way to refuel, okay. we'll have all the information that they can do it. We're going to put optical targets on the bottom of the spacecraft bus so a, a future robotic vehicle could you know come up and align itself yeah. uh, and refuel so right now we don't really have that capability but we didn't want to preclude it but you're so not building that in yeah okay okay um actually coming back for a second to the downlink uh to the the deep space um network do you off the top of your head do you know what the bandwidth is on that someone was curious uh, I don't know, but I'd be happy to look it up uh, okay. and uh, and get it back to you. Okay. Yeah, I don't, don't remember the number off the top of my head. It's actually in the level one requirements. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so here, uh, actually, here's here's another good one. Uh, what kind of precautions do you have to take uh, for events like uh, CMEs and other space weather? Okay. Uh, so the detectors themselves do have some shielding around them to uh, protect the sensitive uh, electronics in the detector. And those are the most sensitive things uh, to uh, the high energy and even some of the low energy uh, solar protons or the cosmic rays. Now, because we're well outside the Earth's um, magnetosphere, some of that, uh, you know, we'll just have to accept that sort of degradation over life. And so all the parts of the mission were designed that they meet their requirements at the end of life, meaning after the end of five years of prime mission, we still have to be able to reach certain sensitivity levels. So that means when we first launch, we'll be a little more capable 
Mm -hmm. uh, than the requirements, but we've built in the knowledge of how we'll degrade with time from the start. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. If any, if anybody has them, that's gone through the list that I had. See if we get any coming through here. I can uh, say. We'll there we go. Here we go. Yeah. Any plans to redo the Hubble Deep Field? Yes. Uh, that uh, in those targets that uh, I mentioned of things people are going to be looking at, there was something called the Goods Field, and I forget what the Goods acronym stands for, but that is essentially what uh, the Deep Field has now become known as. And so, yes, we are going to be looking at that. And uh, that will be really exciting for me because that's why we built this in the first place. And to be able to look at that and say, now you only really do it in a statistical sense, but at some point we'll say, here it is, 200 million years after the Big Bang, this is when the universe turned the lights on. And that'll be pretty exciting. That, yeah, 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 cool. Okay, anybody have one more? Okay, here we go. Uh, will the cryogenic system become depleted around the same time the fuel depletes? Uh, so we have a, a cryo cooler system. So think of it, it's like a refrigerator. It's a closed system uh, that uses gaseous helium to cool the detectors. So uh, the system doesn't need to be recharged. It'll just run as long as the mission works. So uh, early exchanger going. Yeah, uh, early in the design of web, we did a trade. Do we want to take up a doer, which would have a limited lifetime, but is technologically kind of brute forcing it a little simpler. Uh, but that also is mass because you got to take your stored cryogen. And so the cryo cooler was more lightweight, turned out to be a big technological development, but it was the better thing for science. Excellent, excellent. Well, you know, folks, I lied. There is actually time for one more if somebody <laughs> has it. <laughs> like I say, try not a new platform, new method of interaction. Timing is off. What can I say? Uh, well, this is, you know, in, in, the, in the days of modern astronomy and certainly space astronomy, it's all done remotely. So we're, we're just, uh, <laughs> this is how we all do it now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, Eric, I'm not seeing another one come through here now. So... Uh, you know, on behalf of of everybody who joined, we've still got to be like I say, we've got a good a good fifty people on tonight for this. Thank you so much for making time in your weekend to uh, to share this information with us. Um, it's exciting, and I, we're we're all looking forward to to seeing what happens when when web gets up, and even if we do have to wait six months after launch to start to get some of the good. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, th thanks very much, Chris. Um, and best of luck to uh, everyone there and uh, stay safe, folks. All right. Thank you all very much. And with that, let me stop our recording.